What is up, my fellow nerds? Welcome to Tales of Nerdia. This is going to be my very first hypothesis slash theory video revolving around some of the mysteries of Hunter x Hunter, and I plan on doing more of these. Uh, there's many concepts, characters, and ideas that have been introduced to readers and viewers that are never really fully explored, and they're left up to the imagination of fans. One of those mysteries is Kite's Nen ability, Crazy Slots, which has been the cause of many discussions and theories in the Hunter x Hunter community. More specifically, I was trying to seek out information on Crazy Slot number 3 that Kite used against Pito. Now, I did not find the answer to that, but in searching for that answer, I stumbled upon something I never expected, and possibly more interesting, and that is the lore that could have inspired the character of Kite himself. This is also going to give us some clues on Crazy Slot number 3, so I hope you enjoy. So, there isn't much information out there about Kite's Crazy Slot number 3, other than it being commonly referred to as a mace that Kite holds with a reverse grip, which makes sense considering the fingers on the clown are shaped very differently than they were previously depicted on slot number 2 and slot number 4. But something doesn't quite add up. When examining the weapons from slot 2 and 4, you'll notice that the clown is at the end of the weapon. If this were the case for slot 3, then the real point of focus should be that golden piece on the other end. Looking at this shape, I was immediately reminded of two things, the first one being a magic wand from Sailor Moon. And that kind of made sense since Togashi's wife is the creator of Sailor Moon. My other thought, which is more alluring, was that this golden piece with green jewels on it was shaped like a shamrock, or a three-leaf clover. Now before I lose you on this far-fetched road I'm about to take you on, let's jump back to crazy slot number two, the scythe. The scythe is commonly seen as a weapon of choice for none other than the Grim Reaper. The most interesting tale of the Grim Reaper I found was that of the Onko from Celtic folklore. The physical features of the Onko Slightly differ depending on the version, but it usually comes down to being a tall, haggard man with white hair. He's wearing a cloak, wielding a scythe, wearing a large hat which conceals his face. Sound familiar? It's a pretty spot-on depiction of Kite. Another interesting point is that the Onko has also been depicted as a skeleton with a revolving head able to see everything everywhere. And Kite has a similar ability, which is his powerful N, which allows him to feel the shape and movement of everything within 45 meters. The Onko has also been reported as an apparition entering someone's home. It takes away the dead, who are then placed in his cart, with the help of his two ghostly companions. Could this be referring to Gon and Kilua in this case? Maybe that's a bit of a stretch. But this symbolism of death, the Chimera Ant arc is fraught with death. And after defeating Ramit, for the first time Kite himself describes the journey ahead to Gon and Kilua as hell. So it's not hard to see the symbolism of Kite being the Onko, a personification of death. And death is not the only theme found in the Chimera Ant arc. There's also rebirth, which is caused when one is born again, as a chimera ant. This brings me back to crazy slot number three and the golden shamrock. Traditionally, the shamrock is said to have been used by St. Patrick to illustrate the Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity during the Christianization of Ireland. The first depiction appears to show a figure of St. Patrick preaching to a crowd while holding a shamrock, presumably to explain the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And if you're not familiar with the Holy Trinity, it consists of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're wondering if I'm about to compare Kite to Jesus, well, you're kind of right. Similar to the story of Jesus, Kite rose from the dead when he was born as a chimera ant. To further solidify this connection, you only need to examine two things. The first, is the name Kite. And I know in Japanese his name is actually Kaito, but I'm talking about the English version since vowels are often dropped at the end of Japanese words. So literally, I looked up Kite 
to see if there is any connection to Christianity. And on Wikipedia, you won't believe what I found. In Greece and Cyprus, flying kites is a tradition for Clean Monday, which is the first day of Lent. Even better, in Bermuda, traditionally Bermuda kites are made and flown at Easter, a holiday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Finally, I want you to recall this scene of Koala detailing his past to the resurrected Kite in episode 147. Koala tells Kite of how he killed the girl whose body now belongs to Kite. He says how he prayed that her soul would escape. And at the end of this story, he says as if he's speaking to God himself, and now I'm trying to save myself again by confessing my sins to you. So the language that they use in this conversation is as if koala is at confession. So the Catholic Church teaches the sacramental confession uh, that it requires three acts, which is contrition, disclosure of the sins, and satisfaction. Or, in other words, sorrow for the sins you've committed, disclosure of those sins, and then a penance, so doing something to make amends. So throughout Koala's confession, you see that sorrow, that regret. He admits, he confesses his sins to Kite. And at the very end, his penance is issued out by Kite as follows. お前は私と来い。これからずっとだ。お前が打った私のそばで。これからずっとこれしかないって生き方をするんだ。これはお前の義務だ。選択の余地なんかない。自ら死んでリセットなんて誰が許すか。毎日私に謝りながら生きろ